get prepared for a super deep dive into the deep end of the Illuminati swimming pool, we are going to attack some seriously mysterious and esoteric topics head on, important topics. So roll up your sleeves and prepare for a super in-depth conversation delving into such issues as conspiracy theory, the past, the present, and the future of Freemasonry, Freemasonic splendor, and its decadence, the meaning and importance of secrecy, esotericism, globalism, technology, science, and the greatest issues of humanity. Our guests work on a recent project on these issues with Grand Master Giuliano Di Bernardo, and we are going to jump down the rabbit hole of artificial intelligence and transhumanism. Put your tray tables up and secure your safety belts for this flight plan because I finally get to speak with the mighty Nicholas Laos, the sovereign grand commander. Grand Master of the Esoteric Initiatory Grand Lodge, speaking to us from Greece. He's been hard to get a hold of as he's been flying all over the world, recently returning from Italy, where he has just finished a summer solstice ceremony. The one, the only, Nicholas Laos. <laughs> Blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like it need visine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like it need visine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Blast off on another epic episode of the Hyper Anomalous Esoteric Research organization podcast aka hero paranormal broadcasting from the base at la madre mountain just south of area 51 my name is ryan the anomalous ambassador of the airwaves bringing you an extremely esoteric episode tonight before we get to all that if you haven't had a chance to check out heroparanormal.com please do you can also access hero paranormal on patreon For the price of a boutique cup of coffee a month, you get the entire array of content behind the paywall, and there's a ton of it. Also, if you could help me try to break through the algorithm of control, please go to Hero Paranormal on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. The shadow ban is very real, and at least that way people can actually hear the episode. So it would be a big favor to me, and I appreciate it. Also, please subscribe to Hero Paranormal on social media, Facebook and Instagram. It's not only a great way to follow the podcast, but a great way to contact and communicate with me with topics such as the upcoming Ask Me Anything episode that is going to be revolving around the Las Vegas alien encounter. Get those questions to me at heroparanormal at yahoo.com or even better via social media at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Let's not waste time. Let's get down to business. The one, the only, Nicholas Laos. Welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. Thank you very much indeed, Ryan. It is such a pleasure to have you on. There is so much going on in the world, and you have done a lot of work um, going into the information involved with the uh, modern and perfecting rite of symbolic masonry. You are a 33rd degree honorary mason. You've written a new book. You are a sovereign grand commander slash grand master of the esoteric initiatory grand lodge. And I, I want to, I want to discuss a lot of issues, but let's start with, if it's okay with you, what got you into Freemasonry, 
and also the issues with Freemasonry in the past, the present, and the future? Oh, thank you very much. This is a great question because um, in order to answer it, uh, I have to, if, please allow me to, to clarify a few terms. And by clarifying those terms, I believe that uh, my motives will become clear. So if we start by asking ourselves, what is Freemasonry? Uh, I think uh, we have a creative way uh, of understanding uh, our position and our choice within this institution. So what is Freemasonry? Um, my, shorter answer, my shortest answer, which is based on the work of my mentor, a philosopher and uh, Grand Master Mason, uh, Giuliano di Bernardo, is that Freemasonry is a conception of humanity that is inspired by universal ethical principles. So within this definition, we, I can identify immediately two fundamental terms, conception of humanity and universal ethical principles. The term conception of humanity brings us immediately in the realm of what we call philosophical anthropology, and the term universal ethical principles brings us again immediately in the realm of philosophy and more specifically practical philosophy, which is the study of the basis of philosophy for practical thinking with the emphasis on values, attitudes to life, and norms of behavior. Uh, therefore, uh, the second question emerges, which is, what are these universal ethical principles on which the Masonic conception of humanity is based? Again, uh, Following the, the Masonic philosophy of Giuliano di Bernardo, I would define those uh, principles as freedom, tolerance, fraternity, transcendence, and initiatory secret. The first four principles of Freemasonry, namely freedom, tolerance, fraternity, and transcendence, Freemasonry shares with other conceptions of humanity, but the fifth, namely the initiatory secret, is Freemasonry's specific principle, namely the principle that makes it unique and different from all other, from all other anthropologies. So, from this attitude towards Freemasonry, it follows that anthropologies can be defined into two categories. Religious anthropologies, which postulate the existence of an ontological divinity, and secular anthropologies, which are inspired by a set of ethical principles. According to the tradition that I follow and the research that I have pursued, Masonic anthropology belongs to the category of secular anthropology. Of course, there are also mystical anthropologies, uh, which are a sui generis category of anthropologies because mystical anthropologies are neither religious in the narrow sense nor secular. And I would like to highlight the difference between mystical anthropologies and my conception of secular Masonic anthropology. Mm -hmm. Having said this, uh, I think that I have indirectly yet 
clearly identified my way of understanding Freemasonry and therefore my choice um, of pursuing this path. And if I can summarize uh, what I have just said, I, I could um, uh, respond as follows. Mm -hmm. uh, my attitude uh, and my motives regarding uh, Freemasonry are centered on philosophy. So I see uh, Freemasonry as a philosophical institution and as a peculiar philosophical institution because it is endowed with the initiatory secret which makes it, which determines in fact the specific nature of Freemasonry. So, my uh, will to participate in a philosophical institution and in an initiatory tradition which is centered on the concept of the sacred and the distinction between the sacred and the profane as, for instance, René Guénon has identified and defined this distinction are uh, the main motives behind my decision to participate in Freemasonry. Very well put, very well said. And when, when it comes to Masonic anthropology, I really like how you broke that down. I, I would consider, if I were to enter this arena, more of the mystical anthropologist, but that is just because I've had many debates and arguments with fellows who argue that there should not be secrets in Freemasonry, and I disagree. I believe secrets are necessary, and I've had this debate with many who believe that everything should just be out in the open, but I think you nailed it perfectly because that is very much the difference between the sacred and the profane, and I, I, I really liked the principles that you mentioned because that also included the, ini the initi initiatory secret. And I think it's important also for those who are unfamiliar with Giuliano Di Bernardo. He is someone who devoted his adolescence um, to studying the philosophy and then jumped into the order. Uh, so moving on, that's someone that everyone should definitely be familiar with. If you're not familiar with him, I highly recommend if you're a listener, that you look into him. He has amazing works. Moving on, as far as Freemasonry in general, what issues in Freemasonry, such as the past and the present and the future, do you see coming up? Uh, this is indeed uh, very important. First of all, um, seizing the opportunity uh, raised by uh, the fact that you have highlighted the importance of the initiatory secret, I would like to mention mm -hmm. um, that um, uh, Freemasonry from a structural perspective can be represented as a double pyramid. Uh, a double pyramid expressing the profane foundation and the initiatory foundation. The profane foundation refers to standard, socially visible and formal and formalized methods of organization. This is if I may say so, the bureaucratic aspect and the, and the standard exoteric organization of Freemasonic institutions. This is the profane foundation. The initiatory foundation is the esoteric essence, the philosophical essence, the invisible content of a Freemasonic institution. Unfortunately, uh, after 
the end of World War II, Freemasonry, more or less internationally, confused, if I may use this term, the profane foundation and the initiatory foundation. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, again, as Giuliano Di Bernardo has highlighted, authority in Freemasonry, initiatory and profane, descends from the top down. Its symbolic representation, therefore, as a pyramid, means that at the tip of the triangle, there is the Grand Master. It is the Grand Master who determines the processes that follow within this triangular structure. However, a profane democratic model of organization uh, emerged and was almost internationally imposed after World War II implying the overthrow of the initiatory pyramid. Um, and the overthrow of the initiatory pyramid presents some serious consequences. Therefore, we see that a profound contradiction emerges. If Masons perfect themselves by receiving the light from the Grand Master and the Grand Lodge as a council of sages, how is it possible that it is they who choose them? And if the Grand Master has total, in theory, initiatory knowledge, how is it possible that Masons who have partial knowledge can judge the Grand Master choosing between one and the other? So within the context of this reflective attitude towards uh, the system of Freemasonry, the crux of democratic Freemasonry begin to appear. And this brings us to a very serious question. If Freemasonry will ultimately operate as an esoteric philosophical initiatory institution or as a social confraternity or even worse as a social club. This is a very important fundamental question for regarding the presence and the future of Freemasonry. Some other, if I may summarize fundamental questions and challenges is that what we usually understand as traditional regular Freemasonry is characterized by a lack of universality. Uh, and in, in my opinion, in an increasingly globalized world, in an increasingly globalized world, there is no longer place for this conception of Freemasonry uh, with its national territorial restrictions and with the policy of excluding important swathes of society such as women. Uh, this is another great challenge for Freemasonry regarding its presence and future, namely is its attitude and role and identity and structure vis-a-vis -vis globalization and women. Um, Freemasonry in its traditional forms also imposes some other important exclusions. Um, for instance, Traditional regular English Freemasonry requires Masons to declare a religious faith, um, therefore excluding persons who do not want to 
express any religious commitment. Mm. Uh, so, uh, to achieve true universality, I believe that various Freemasonries should review certain doctrinal aspects. And um, the final question to which I would like uh, to uh, um, emphasize, which I would like to emphasize, is the ultimate question. Something that I said before, in other words. So, does Freemasonry still have an esoteric foundation? And this question lies at the very heart of the problem. So, lack of internationalism and universality concerns the so-called profane aspects of Freemasonry, namely its exoteric uh, regulatory rules, but its esoteric foundations that are specific to it are even more important and more challenging because we have to clarify the esoteric essence and orientation and foundation of Freemasonry in the contemporary and in the future worlds. And regarding these issues, we could say that, formally speaking, existing Freemasonries observe a standard esoteric rules in the sense that Masons gather in in the temple, namely a sacred place, uh, wear ceremonial vestments, recite rituals, initiate, pass and raise candidates to the higher degrees, and everything seems to be in order. Yet this is not so. Even though it seems to be in order, it is not necessarily in order. The truth is that all this is often devoid of any authentically esoteric meaning and awareness. And those who perform them do not necessarily know their meaning. And I would like to stress that this makes for a breeding ground from, for profound contradictions, anomalies, uh, conspiracies, uh, unworthy admissions, and so on and so forth. And uh, therefore, uh, we have to address the fundamental issues regarding the history, the identity, and the future of Freemasonry. Um, addressing those fundamental questions which I have just raised and which, on which we could elaborate furthermore. Uh, during this discussion. Very well um, put, Nicholas. I believe you've, you've hit on a bunch of important things. I don't know how to attack them separately, but let me just start uh, by saying I believe that there are everyone has a similar journey, and I'm glad that you've mentioned the sacred versus the profane. I believe three great steps define a man's progress to perfection, and these are all included under the one word of self-control. And many of the secrets, which I believe are necessary, which not only lend to the sacred nature of Freemasonry, but also lend to uh, and I, the, the magic. I mean, I just want to say the magic of Freemasonry. It is a magical, a magical endeavor. And um, you brought up something very important also, which I don't want to uh, move on without attacking, and that is conspiracy, because many of this has entered the genre. And globalism is often objectified and attacked as a possibly negative force in the worldwide agenda of control. In your definition, how how is this misidentified and... Or does it remain a conspiracy in the future? Uh, I could. Uh, I would like to to 
say briefly that uh, very often um, uh, conspiracy is an, a, a term that refers to an actual state of affairs and on other occasions conspiracy is an, a substitute for the lack of knowledge or the lack of understanding. Uh, for instance, uh, given the awareness, the philosophical awareness deficit that I have identified in several contemporary Freemasonic institutions, this deficit, um, this cognitive spiritual deficit regarding awareness, um, provides uh, opportunities for conspiracies, <laughs> micro-conspiracies, if I could say, uh, organized by Masons themselves against their Masonic institutions in order to extract privileges for themselves. Uh, and unfortunately, this creates a very negative environment for Freemasonry in general. So we have even, for instance, uh, profanely motivated schisms in world Freemasonry. Or we have um, new Masonic institutions that pop up and other esoteric societies that pop up as uh, uh, totally profanely motivated initiatives. Um, so there is an, uh, an internal problem of conspiracy, first of all, and there is an external problem of conspiracy. Uh, there are several social actors who, either because they don't understand um, try to uh, find a cognitive shelter in uh, conspiracy theories, or there are also uh, social actors uh, who purposely uh, articulate and disseminate conspiracy theories because they want to purposely uh, misinform and misguide uh, target audiences, and uh, in this case, I should mention that I have noticed that in several countries, um, there are even um, uh, members of the national bureaucracies, of the state bureaucracies, who develop and disseminate conspiracy theories, uh, finding and using easily, easy, easy scapegoats for the masses in order to hide uh, the actual state of affairs. And Freemasonry has become a victim of such conspiracies. Um, for instance, uh, I have noticed uh, and I have researched in countries like Greece and Italy that even uh, 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 state bureaucrats uh, w uh, affiliated to the uh, services uh, dealing with uh, uh, national security um, uh, have occasionally uh, themselves uh, developed and disseminated conspiracy theories in order to, to manipulate the masses, uh, ignite uh, specific uh, ideological uh, communities, conflicts, and so on and so forth, and even uh, cultivate um, uh, certain political tendencies, visions, and so on and so forth, uh, through uh, several uh, uh, neo-mythologies, and they create a neo-mythology. For instance, in Greece, I have not, I am well aware of operations conducted by uh, the Greek establishment in order to cultivate nationalist neo-mythologies, uh, 
and use Freemasonry to disseminate them. But uh, regarding globalism, I would say that uh, a form of globalism uh, has always existed in the history of humanity to the extent that uh, there are science, ideas, and technologies. Science, ideas, and technologies tend to uh, move and cross through borders. And therefore, from the perspective of, sci of science, ideas, and technologies, uh, globalism, a form of globalism, a okay, kind of globalism, an extent of, glo of globalism, is the natural state of affairs for humanity, for civilized humanity. The acceleration of science and technology during the 20th century has naturally accelerated the process and the dynamism of globalism. And the acceleration of globalism has naturally given rise to naturally global issues. By global issues, I mean issues that by their very nature call for global solutions. And the emergence of global issues, in turn, naturally calls for a kind of global governance. Uh, at this point, I would like to stress that I use the term global governance and not global government. This is something different. Mm -hmm. Global governance may take several forms. And, in fact, I would like to kindly refer to uh, our audience to, to a, an essay written by Immanuel Kant entitled Perpetual Peace, in which he very cleverly addressed the issue of global governance as opposed to a narrowly defined global government. Uh, therefore... Um, if we see globalism as a natural problem and as a natural issue, not as something negative, but as something that emerges from the development of science, ideas, and technologies, then we are able to start dealing with issues of quality, namely with issues regarding the management of, global, of globalization rather than the idealization or the demonization of globalization. And this is something to which contemporary, the major currents of contemporary Freemasonry uh, have failed uh, to deal with. This is something with which contemporary Freemasonries uh, have failed to deal with because they, they remain uh, restricted to old uh, varieties and uh, structural issues of Freemasonic organization. Very, very important. And you, you've mentioned a few topics that I, I want to get to. They're somewhat interrelated. And um, the first is Freemasonry's splendor, its decadence, and they seem to have always been present. Uh, firstly, I wanted to ask, are they necessary aspects of Freemasonry? And secondly, uh, the, the profanely motivated initiatives which you mentioned are very involved in modern conspiracy theories and the targeting of people who seem to be drawn towards the initiation with promises of material wealth and riches I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen. 
a number of these fly-by-night modern clubs, secret societies, and even online brotherhoods, which have unfairly, in my opinion, taken segments or traits of Freemasonry and tried to act as if they have all the answers to the secrets necessary to become wealthy, healthy, and material, materially superior to their fellows. While I believe uh, Freemasonry does in fact offer guidance, of course, to achieve one's goals in all aspects, these commercialized profane charlatans do a really good job of stealing Masonic symbolism. Can this be stopped? Can these frauds and charlatans be stopped? Or is it better to just ignore them altogether? Uh, in the era of advanced globalization and liberal democracy, such phenomena of charlatanism, pseudo-orders, pseudo-masonries, pseudo-illuminists, Pseudo orders, pseudo Illuminati, and so on and so forth, that we are very well aware of internationally, cannot be suppressed, uh, but they can be eliminated only when the authentic and to a much extent pure if not perfectly pure, esoteric institutions prevail. And in order for them to prevail, they have to really define and rediscover their identities and their missions. In a new world, then they have to start being increasingly inspired by the future rather than by the past. Even if the past is important and idealized and useful, no doubt about that, we have to invite genuine Freemasonries to start looking for inspiration from the future as well. And this is inextricably linked to the declared goal of building a temple for humanity. Not a stone temple, of course, but an invisible temple of a philosophical nature a temple consisting of constitutive and regulatory rules for a better humanity within a better society. And the building of this temple is, by definition, a future project. So, rather than being constrained by a basic ritualism and by a unidimensional reference to privileged moments of the past, which have to continue, of course, inspire and guide us, we have to highlight the importance of establishing Freemasonic institutions enriched with a vision for the future. This is very important, and if I may take a few minutes, I would like to say why this is a philosophical challenge. Mm -hmm. if, we think, if we think about philosophy, we, we, we realize that in putting a few words, philosophers are preoccupied with methodic and systematic in the investigations of the problems which originate from the reference of consciousness to the world and itself. 
So philosophers are preoccupied with the problems that originate from humanity's attempt to articulate a qualitative interpretation of the integration of the consciousness of existence into the reality of the world. And these problems pertain to the world itself, to consciousness, and to the relation between consciousness and the world. These are the fundamental constructive building issues. These are the, quint the quintessence of symbolic building, building human beings and building societies. Therefore, of course, one could say that scientists are also preoccupied with similar problems. Yes, indeed. But there are two important differences between the level of abstraction that is represented by philosophy and the level of abstraction that is represented by science. First of all, from the perspective of science, it suffices to find and formulate relations and laws, what we call scientific generalizations, that under certain conditions and to some extent can interpret the objects of scientific research. Philosophy, on the other hand, moves beyond these findings and formulations in order to evaluate the objects of philosophical research and ultimately to articulate a general method and a general criterion for the explanation of every object of philosophical research. So, whereas sciences, the different, the different particular scientific disciplines consist of images and explanations of these images, Philosophies are formulated by referring to wholes, by inducing wholes from parts. And therefore, uh, for instance, we could say that a philosopher will ask such questions as what is scientific about science or what is the true meaning of science. And therefore, <clears throat> Philosophy and science differ from each other with regard to the level of generality that characterizes their endeavors. Secondly, as the French philosopher Pierre Adot uh, pointed out in his book entitled Philosophy as a Way of Life, unlike the various scientific disciplines, philosophy is not merely a science, but it is a way of life. And more specifically, according to Adon, philosophy implies a conscious being's free and deliberate decision to seek truth for the sake of knowledge itself, since a philosopher is aware that knowledge is inextricably linked to the existential freedom, the creativity, and the ontological integration and completion of the human being. Therefore, have, having said the above about philosophy, I would, I would like to, to stress again this deficit of philosophical awareness and philosophical education within contemporary, within the major mainstream contemporary Freemasonic institutions, which unfortunately preserve a, rich, a ritualistic tradition, but without the adequate educational and interpretive endeavors. Very interesting. Very interesting and well put, Nicholas. You, you mentioned that esotericism, globalism, technology, and science, as you've declared, are the great issues of humanity. And... Humanity stands at a defining moment, I believe, in history right now, confronted with disparities between nations, uh, poverty, hunger, illiteracy, and the deterioration of many ecosystems, both natural and within ourselves, philosophically. My question is, the, the steady implementation of technology and artificial intelligence has been focused on 
significantly by the United Nations and other summits and other groups. In your opinion, is the implementation of artificial intelligence a threat to humanity, Illuminism, and Freemasonry? Yes, indeed. Um, this is a great challenge and something to which Freemasonry and Illuminism as custodians of great spiritual traditions can respond in a creative, positive, and an indeed, indeed enlightening way. First of all, let me open the parenthesis to, to mention that my approach to esotericism is that esotericism is a way of pursuing human happiness, if I may put it in very few words. The purpose of esotericism has to be, and indeed naturally is, to serve the pursuit of happiness. I'm closing this parenthesis. Interpreting esoteric institutions in this way implies that we have to deal with, with great contemporary challenges arising from globalism and artificial intelligence. Before, uh, before answering your question regarding artificial intelligence, I would like, because it has now crossed my mind, um, to address the issue of meaning, which will help me to answer your question regarding artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning is a constituent element of language, and this is something very important because artificial intelligence is focused on language, a machine language, a code, a system of managing data, but it does not cover the issue of meaning. Uh, a great German philosopher, Edmund Husserl, uh, used the Greek term noema, uh, in plural noemata, meanings, to designate the intentional object, meaning that element due to which an intention of the human being, such as one's intention to say something, to move one's hand, etc., acquires content and becomes significant. In particular, in, in, in uh, Husserl's book entitled Ideas, uh, where he introduced the Greek term noema, uh, meaning thought, or what is thought about, Husserl argued that any conscious experience is directed towards an object and that corresponding to all points in the manifold data of the real mental content, there is a variety of data displayable in pure intuition and in a correlative noematic content, or briefly noema. So according to Husserl, every intentional act has noematic content, or briefly noema, meaning, and is a mental act process, such as an act of judging, meaning, liking, etc. Therefore, it is directed towards the intentionally held object, such as the judged as judged, the meant as meant, the liked as liked, etc. In other words, every intentional act has as part of its formation a correlative noima, which is the object of the act. Artificial intelligence is a brilliant discovery, something highly promising, but it deals with data and the acts 
it does not deal with the meaning with which data can be endowed and with the object of the acts. For instance, artificial intelligence can immensely help the development of medicine, for instance, and genome research, but artificial intelligence can never substitute for the responsible decision of the doctor of medicine to interpret the so constructed database and to formulate the final prescription for the patient for the patient by this i want to say that artificial intelligence can support can indeed support the development of humanity but i cannot take seriously any discussion regarding fears about the substitution of humanity by artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence by its nature cannot achieve this ontological revolution and it cannot achieve this ontological re revolution for two reasons first of all because artificial intelligence itself is a human construct rather than the other way around and second because artificial intelligence deals with data and not with the noimata according to Husserl's terminology namely it can deal with the management of data but it cannot have the final word word regarding the interpretation and the complexity of significations related and referring to any database mm, i see yeah that that's a very very good way to put it and before as as we slowly get towards the finish line and start to wrap up nicholas i wanted yes. to i wanted to make sure that we don't, um, I know we're going to, I have more questions, but I wanted to make sure that we don't glide over the fact of your new book, The Modern and Perfecting Right of Symbolic Masonry. And I will also include a link uh, for listeners where they can download and read the book. Um, can you tell listeners about the book and uh, anything else having to do with it, where they can find information on it, etc.? Yes, indeed, and thank you very much for, for mentioning. Um, uh, let me uh, say very briefly my uh, background regarding this book. My, my, my intention uh, was uh, to serve traditional symbolic masonry as we know it in the Anglo-Saxon world, world and traditional ancient and accepted Scottish rite as again we know it in the Anglo-Saxon world. But I want to offer my services by enriching the educational aspects of these worthy Masonic traditions with a set of lectures like, for instance, um, uh, we no, the, 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 the lectures accompanying um, the emulation rite in England. So I thought that given the enlightenment that I have received from my participation in the Academia degli Illuminati, which has been founded in Rome by my mentor, Giuliano Di Bernardo, who is also a former Grand Master of Italian Freemasonry, and my experience and knowledge acquired through my participation in the Scottish Rite um, in, in, in Italy, where I belong to the 
uh, Italian obedience of the Scottish Rite, and I have uh, received the honor of the 33rd degree as an active member of the 33rd degree. I would like to combine these uh, enlightening experiences and provide an online educational material which seeks to endow a contemporary Freemason with philosophical, uh, historic, sociological uh, sets of training and knowledge that can help him or her uh, earn more during his or her Masonic journey. And I would like again to say that this book, which is totally uh, downloadable in its entirety, downloadable uh, on the website www.mprsmgrandlodge.net. Um, I would like to acknowledge again uh, the training that I have received in order to write it by the Grand Loggia Initiatica Esoterica in, in Italian, I said the title in, it, in Italian, it's an Italian obedience of symbolic masonry and Scottish Rite. It is, in English, it is Esoteric Initiatory Grand Lodge, and to the Academia degli Illuminati and the Dignity Order. These are the three major pillars of my training. Uh, and having said that, of course, I never lose sight of my mother lodge in symbolic masonry, which is the Honor Peronus Lodge under the auspices of the United Grand Lodge of England. Um, but I have pursued uh, my uh, career in, in, in Scottish Rite Masonry in the Grand Lodge Initiatica Esoterica, and I have enriched my Masonic experience through uh, Giuliano di Bernardo's uh, Illuminati Order. And therefore, uh, I have somehow combined all these experiences in a scholarly set um, whose purpose is a scholarly set of training whose purpose is, as I said, to make one's Masonic journey in standard contemporary uh, uh, Freemasonry. I, al I always refer to genuine Masonic institutions, not pseudo-Illuminati nor uh, pseudo-Masonic orders. Uh, I want to make one's journey in, in uh, authoritative Masonic institutions richer and uh, help uh, contemporary Freemasons use their Freemasonry in order to better understand and better tackle uh, problems that arise from contemporary uh, social, political, economic, and cultural uh, issues and challenges. Mm. Very well put. And as we wrap up here, I, I know we, we attacked the subject of artificial intelligence, another very important topic um, in this technological era seems to be the evolution into transhumanism. And some have argued that this agenda began with founders of Rosicrucianism, John D., Francis Bacon, as well as those who brought on the scientific revolution. And most of the leading scientists of Western history have been secretly adherents of the occult, including Isaac Newton, who was a member of the Royal Society, and Benjamin Franklin, who was a Freemason, a member of the Fraternitas Rosicrucis, and of course a member of the Hellfire Club, which allegedly had distant ties to an elite society known only as the Order of the Second Circle. Point being, some have said that transhumanism is Freemasonry for the technological age. Is this an unfair estimation? Or are there some tidbits of truth to this statement, in your opinion? Mm. 
Yes and no. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, transhumanism becomes has a has a degenerate, if I may use this term, has a degenerate variety. A degenerate version of of transhumanism, in my opinion, is what we could call post-humanism. Um, I, but transhumanism uh, can have a an, an, an empowering influence. Uh, post-humanism, post-humanism, aims at changing the human being into a different kind of being, and uh, is often associated with the algorithmization of human life. But transhumanism, as I see it, aims at enabling the human being to actualize its ontological potential rigorously and comprehensively uh, through various methods of spiritual and material empowerment. And instead of promoting an elementary algorithmization of human life, it reinforces human creativity. Furthermore, I could say that not only is transhumanism different from posthumanism, but it also can be considered as an attempt to make humanity even more humane, and hence as something clearly opposite to posthumanism, in the sense that transhumanism may be construed as a rigorous and comprehensive ontological upgrading of the human being whereas posthumanism may be construed as a systematic attempt to ontologically degrade the human being to the point of transforming it into a completely algorithmizable biomechanical being. And finally, far from negating spirituality, transhumanism is an expression of the creativity of the human spirit since both the transhumanistic vision of humanity's evolution and technology proceed from and express the human spirit. We have never, uh, we, we must never cease to forget that all of these are human constructs. And at bottom, technology consists in the integration of ideas into matter and in the restructuring of the material world according to the intentionality of human consciousness. Therefore, rather than dealing with the results of the, of the manifestation of the intentionality of human consciousness, we have to address issues of practical philosophy concerning the motives, the underpinning values, and the rules of human consciousness and human societies. By this I want to say that we have, before dealing in, with the results of the intentionality of human consciousness, we have to take a step back, descend to a more fundamental level, and examine and evaluate the motives, the values, and the rules of the human consciousness that creates transhumanistic institutions, artificial intelligence, new technologies, and new institutions. This is, in my opinion, where the key to understanding and controlling evolution lies. Thank you so much for putting it that way. That is a great, a great answer. And as you... <laughs> very well put. 
And um, Nicholas, as usual, your answers to the many questions have not only fulfilled my my question, but have gone above and beyond an explanation of these important questions for humanity. And thank you for taking time out of your busy day. You are a wealth of knowledge, and I consider you a very sacred asset to those of us concerned with the broader future of humanity, illumination, and life itself. Could you briefly tell our listeners where they can keep uh, up with you and your work? Thank you very much, Ryan, for giving me the honor and the pleasure to have this discussion and other discussions with you. Regarding a, a point of communication, first of all, anyone can reach me through you. It would be an honor and a pleasure to be contacted through you, to be contact, uh, contacted through you. And of course, anyone can email me at uh, the following two emails: office at mprsmgrandlodge.net, and an, and another email is the email. One word, all this one word that I will say, Grandmaster E I G L G at gmail.com. They are available, both emails are available on the website mprsmgrandlodge.net. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you. Always a unique pleasure. Speaking with someone as knowledgeable about Freemasonry, the esoteric, and illuminous concepts as Nicholas Laos. I know that was a heck of a deep dive. Probably dove right into the deep side of the pool for a lot of you. And that's because I wanted to make sure and use my time speaking with Nicholas as wisely as possible. I don't get to talk to him all the time. The secret societies and sacred fraternal organizations of our world have walls of confidentiality that are often hard to breach. So I definitely praise the opportunity of speaking with Nicholas Laos, the sovereign grand commander, grand master of the esoteric initiatory Grand Lodge for sharing his thoughts and summarizing complex, difficult subjects very well. I often speak with opposing factions of what is broadly called the Illuminati, and I've been asked why. In my opinion, Nicholas believes that there are those who support traditional nationalism and those who support a misguided variety of globalization that seeks to globalize one power's own interest. Nicholas is a genuine globalist, and... As odd as it may sound, contrary to popular belief, there are not many advocates of globalism as purely globalism, especially in such an altruistic way as Nicholas views the topic. Mr. Laos has written many knowledge-filled works, the last of which does not fail to astound me of his deep esoteric knowledge. It is important to be fair and hear all sides of the Freemasonic agenda. Nicholas Laos is a master of his craft, and I highly recommend all listeners download his book online, and I've included a link in the description. Also, check out his other books, as they are equally amazing. Until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. In my time machine, third eye feeling like an evizine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine, third eye feeling like an evizine. Blast off.